this is basically one of my lectures. It's going to be a bit of a long one because many notes. Anyway, we officially begin 21,000 BC in Harlow, which is in Israel, where there is evidence of the first small scale crop growing or failed agriculture attempt that obviously failed because we don't see plants for like another 12,000 years after that. But before that happens, we have further evidence of a possible plentiful supply of hops because in a cave in Israel, there are mortars set down in the cave floor, which were clearly used for brewing beer, which implies that there was a plentiful supply of the ingredients needed for that. A thousand years after this, 12,000 years ago, the Natufians began to breed officially officially domesticated dogs. We don't exactly know how long that had been going on for previously, but that is evidence that people must have been settling in a particular places to be able to have bred the undesirable characteristics out of the wolf populations there into new species, i.e. dogs, showing evidence of settling and therefore possible early urbanization and farming. Because in the next two to 4,000 years, we see a major shift from hunter-gatherer nomadic tribes into settled farmers. Now, there are three theories as to why this happened. First, there is Oasis theory, thought up by Gordon Child. And basically, he thought that, get my notes out here. <clears throat> Due to Atlantic depressions shifting northwards, the climate became very dry and therefore animals and humans were forced together in little oases in the area. I guess prompting people to start herding cattle and growing crops in the places where they had water because they were not naturally growing anywhere else at this point. Secondly, there is population pressure theory thought up by Mark Cohen, which basically says that due to certain population pre pressures such as climate change again there not being enough food for a growing population or there being some sort of social competition agriculture was the next development for humans the more a population grows the more food it needs the less there is in the wild to feed the people and therefore the people need to find a way to feed themselves not relying on the wild and theory three by hodder and hayden says that due to social competition people tribes bands would hold feasts for each other and basically they would try and compete as to who could provide the most food who had the biggest bounty who had the most plentiful supply of grain and so they had to start growing stuff in order to impress each other and basically passive aggressiveness is the root of all evil now, all three theories are probably true to some extent. I'd say that Gordon Child's theory is probably the most likely. It's backed up by the fact that sheep were domesticated 8,500 BC, cereals were domesticated between 8,700 to 8,200 BC, and cows, cattle, were domesticated in 8,000 BC. Although, having said that, most archaeologists now reject this theory as they believe that the climate was getting wetter, not drier, during this period. Now, aside from Jericho, not surprisingly, soon to follow this was the first famous large-scale structure built by people between 8 to 9,000 BC, Gobekli Tepe, which is seen as the world's first temple. Now, the fact that this was constructed shows that even if there were nomadic tribes that constructed it, that if nothing else, it had to have been built by people with a unified sort of belief system, or if not belief system, just way of life, who wanted some sort of communal central place to worship meaning that there was already cultural sharing happening, shared ideas, a founded belief system and cooperation going on between a large group of people. Additionally to this, the people that built it had to have been settled there for at least a period of time. Therefore, it was one of the first major places of settlement, likely also meaning that people probably began to farm around that area in order to feed themselves. 
Now, people think that they had some sort of very animal-related religion that they all adhered to because of the carvings depicted on the monoliths. Obviously, we don't exactly know, but that's how it looks. And again, like the cave, they had big, massive brewing vats for beer because they too knew how to have a good time. Another example of culture sharing at this time was the Tel Aswad plastered skulls which have been found over a vast area, which was a type of embalmment for the head that was reserved for the higher, more sophisticated people in society, which again just shows sharing of ideas between a large group of people and likely trading and migration and coming together and intermarrying, intermarrying, intermarrying and probably settling. I'm back post haircut and it's cold now. But anyway, moving on to the world's oldest and most famous town or city, Chatelhoyuk, which dates to around 6,500 BC to 5,500 BC. It covered an area of about 12 hectares and had a thousand houses in total and a population of five to 6,000. Now, with that sort of population, obviously we're gonna have to assume that they were most certainly farmers. They would not hunter gathering they were not going out spearing big game for each meal and it must have taken a bit of time to accumulate a population of that size that you cannot have a hunter gatherer group that's 5,000 people strong because it's just not gonna work they're gonna want a rest they're gonna want a lie down they're gonna want some sort of constant food supply so this was an organized town with organized social structures and farming. Also they had a weird custom of burying their dead underneath their beds. I, that apparently that, that didn't faze them. According to the people of Chateau Hoyuk, it's fine to have your granny sleeping beneath you. Not for me personally, but you know. Now, pastoral agriculture is moving from the Middle East out towards the rest of Europe and reaches Britain about one and a half thousand years after it's first practiced. So around 6,500 to 6000 BC. So that is the domestication of cattle, goats, sheep and pigs and all that. But it took a little while longer for the domestication of wheat to reach English shores, presumably because it's a bit more difficult to take your wheat field with you opposed to your herd of cows if you are moving from place to place. But finally, the domestication of wheat reached Britain in 4500 to 5000 BC, which was lovely for the neolithic people although a large amount of europe's population at this time were still hunter-gatherer tribes now at this time it's also important to note the prevalence and importance importance of importance of trading cyprus being a good example of this the cypriots did not domesticate wheat or pigs for that matter they instead imported wild boar and grain from the mainland and pottery in fact and they had a culture of making a lot of clay figures and then basically there was a massive cultural change and they eventually did start growing their own stuff but that shows how connected people were over quite a large area the fact that trading and overseas trading was going on along with the advent of agriculture moving on a bit though to about 5500 bc we have the beginnings of LBK culture, which stands for Linine Band Ceramic. I think that's maybe how you pronounce it, I don't know. Owing to their very characteristic style of pottery. They're also quite famous for living in longhouses and they use the Danube. So basically, basically, they traveled through Europe up the Danube and then sort of progressed out into Eastern and Central Europe bringing a lot of their culture along with them and lasted for a good thousand years. Generally they had a habit of burying their dead by their houses. There have been quite a few infants found next to the remains of longhouses and when their old longhouse collapsed or began to collapse they would just build a new one right next to it and then when people went off to start their own families, got married, there was conflict, whatever, that unit of people would separate from the family, go off and build their own longhouse. So at this time, hello, at this time, hunter gathering, as I said, was still quite prevalent. Even about 3000 BC, there was a lot of tribes around. 
So this would have been a relatively new concept for people who had not come across it before. Diet can be found from Neolithic DNA and it shows that a lot of the Neolithic people, especially as hunter-gatherers, ate a lot of fish and when they converted to farming, they came to the dark side. That stopped and they just ate wheat which in fact led to a decrease in health, generally speaking, because they just were eating wheat, you know. There's only so much Weetabix one can eat every day. And obviously, being settlers, they grew wheat and barley and herded cattle. Now, there are several examples of these LBK settlements, some being Bielani, which is situated about 40 miles east of Prague in the Czech Republic, or Czechia as it is now known, which is a LBK site made up of around 130 houses and is one of the main sites in Europe. Elslu is one of the largest settlements within the Limburg region of the Netherlands and dates to around 5000 BC. Rondel enclosures such as the Heldenberg enclosure in Lower Austria were the precursors to later Neolithic and Bronze Age henges. Generally, they date from between 4800-4600 BC and were later adapted by the Lengiel culture, among others. And structures like these, as well as the settlements, help to inspire the future lives of later Neolithic people. And several burial mounds that are spread across a lot of Europe, you know, there's billions, not billions, millions, not probably not millions, hundreds, tens of thousands, many burial mounds around Britain and the rest of Europe. So that was just a thing. That was just a thing that carried on. However, at about 4,500 BC, the LBK longhouses, they ceased to exist. It seems around the time that megaliths began to be constructed around Europe, a lot around, especially like France and Britain. That's when the LBK culture stopped. So we've got first records of megaliths being constructed in Brittany around 4,700 BC. And obviously that became a widely done craze. Stonehenge was built another thousand years later, a bit, bit more, but you know, roughly. And you've just got megaliths everywhere. People were obsessed. Some of them were up to a kilometer long and it was big. Generally speaking, throughout the rest of Europe, once the LBK culture had disappeared obviously there was the celtic celtic culture not called that at the time generally a lot of tribes and a lot of new cultures that spread sprang up over various parts of europe britain and really until the romans popped up 2000 years ago britain and the rest of europe stayed pretty tribal it is only when we go back to the middle east and asia that we begin to see older proper civilizations which brings me to 4000 bc in Uruk, in Mesopotamia. And this is where urbanization really came into its own. In Middle East, Asia, you know, you got Ur, Uruk, the Egyptians, China, Thailand, India, the Indus Valley. Basically, Europe was left behind. And although many tribes in Europe did adopt farming and adopt a settled life and began to have larger villages, they did not have quite the industry, quite the industrious mines and materials that were available in other parts of the world. Until the Romans came, that is, of course, and colonised everything and put the Roman stamp of approval on every plot of land that it set foot on. And that is really when Europe took off, so that's that's just that really. That, I know that was a bit of a rambly end, but it is what it is. Hope you enjoyed it. Please stop being windy, please. Which is evidenced because in the next two to four thousand years, what happened? Something. Jordan. No, no, 